this idea of divine is present and everything as an idea is so beautiful and so inspirational um, but what does that mean factual what does that mean in a partner relationship what does that mean with your children what does that even mean for myself um, I'm divine too and to meet my spouse in divinity it is also up to me to live up to that right <laughs> Action. Welcome to the Spirit of Yoga. We are Kirsten and Dave Das from the Akasha Yoga Academy. In today's tea chat, we explore the topic of connection. We will be looking into partner connection. We'll be looking into connection to our children and we'll be looking into connection to life and to the divine as such. And one of our teachers loves to say yoga is intimacy with life. And I feel like that's just such a, like there's so much juiciness in that single sentence, right? You can just contemplate it again and again and again and again, and you can still find sources of inspiration in it. And I feel like the, um, I mean, kind of some background on it. It's like in the, in the Vedic scriptures and the Vedic way of thinking that kind of brought yoga into being, the thinking was, your spouse, your child, your Ishta Devata, your chosen form of the divine, are all one. Like they're all one expression. And so, you know, kind of actively being engaged in seeing the divinity anywhere from the flower to the murti to the wife to the child and beyond is the kind of ideal of that culture. And I guess then the question comes how do we actualize that like how do we bring that into our reality and really experience it as our reality and not just as an ideal that we hold up for for ourselves yeah it's a very tantric approach to life uh, to spirituality to really um see the manifestation as God, as the divine, as what is already perfect mm. um, and there. I feel that is a view which is extremely far reaching and extremely profound. Um, this idea of divine is present and everything as an idea is so beautiful and so inspirational um, but what does that mean factual what does that mean in a partner relationship what does that mean with your children what does that mean with your colleagues what uh, what does that mean how what does that even mean for myself um, I'm divine too and to meet my spouse in divinity, it is also up to me to live up to that, right? Yeah. So it has two parts, um, and I feel it tremendously powerful, actually, mm. to, to bind the spiritual practice and the spiritual ideas into actuality and into life itself. So I find it very, very beautiful, actually, this idea that, your partner is your guru, your husband mm. is your guru. Um, and to meet each other in this way. Um, so for me, that has definitely something that helps me personally to step out basically of inherited relationship patterns um, that I inherited, learned, copied, took over from my family, from my own upbringing, how my mother and my father have been relating, how my family around is relating to one another in partner relationship. And it's so easy uh, to simply repeat these patterns. And even if you 
make a strong commitment that you do that exactly the opposite way because there are certain things that you don't find harmon harmonious. It is like this push and pull game like mm. this, you know, I see that, but I want to do different. And um, this whole, you know, lifting basically relationship onto a completely different level of existence. Um, meeting basically in the already perfect um, mm. I feel powerfully helps uh, to live basically partnership relationship in its higher form beautiful beautiful so you mentioned kind of letting go of patterns and family patterns in your own journey of kind of letting go of the past or or mm -hmm. the cycles that have been present generationally for for you what's been the most effective tool in that process like where do you feel like what what were moments that you felt like ah you know like i i cracked the code or you know i i i took a step up in that journey I don't recall that many, you know, like particular moments. Like I recall one that um, that was a moment in between us where we were under a lot of pressure and stress. Um, it was at the beginning of COVID where we had to redefine ourselves completely anew within no time, basically, and dealing with a world that went upside down. Um, and a very young child and um, I remember you um, showing me or complaining in a way but what it was was showing me uh, that I would be acting unkind and mm. violent in a way towards you and pondering that kind of showed me that my reaction to a stressful situation is kind of an inner hardening and in a way like um, as a result of that coming unkindness and mm. um, and like a, a violent expression in speech basically yeah. rushing stress and uh, that being reflected um, was also a super good reflection of my own relationship with myself how mm. i meet life probably as also a pattern that came from just growing up yeah and by getting that mirrored so clearly i felt like this is not how i can meet you like um maybe i can meet you as a husband like that but like it's not how i want to meet you as the one who is showing me the light in my heart, like this mm. is not how I can, how I can meet you. Mm. And by seeing that and understanding, I felt it could be dropped. Yeah, isn't isn't that kind of like that's one of the most powerful and interesting things? It's like I feel like many times people have this idea that when they overcome a pattern, it's like that there's fireworks or something you know it happens but many times it's just like oh wow i see that and that's not what i want and it's just like drops away and i even remember in the moment of you showing to me and i seeing it i kind of asked for permission kind of to you know have that as a pattern that i that plays out but um, that needs time kind of to be overcome in a way. Yeah. Um, but I feel actually that was even not necessary because by this seeing and recognizing and just this clear intention, like this is not how I want to show up. Mm. Um, it could be left behind very easily and uh, without trumpets, uh, as yeah. you say, yeah. um, and just recognizing a while after, like, hey, you know what? That's not my set of reactions anymore. Mm. Like it's wow. removed from the palette, basically, of, wow. uh, of reactions. Um, yeah, so 
I feel this seeing divinity in life, in mm. Mm. in you, in our children, mm. in myself, mm. in whatever we meet, um, is a call, not only a call, but an urge in a way to, you know, to just elevate and to step mm. up and to refine, like it's just mm. like, it's just changing the bob in a way like yeah. it's um, yeah yeah and it's interesting what you were sharing about you know um just right there i feel like the when i was kind of thinking about this topic of connection and partnership connection i like my kind of intuitive sense was like many people are just in their the kind of like aggressive side of their nervous system most of the time in a day you know they're yeah. just kind of like in fight or flight and they're kind of running through the day and they're stressed and they're anxious and they're all those things and i feel like the the kind of rest and relax function is not so present and of course that affects everything but it also profoundly affects our our ability in relationships right it's like I was actually kind of wondering, and I don't know if it's true or not, but as we were contemplating the topic, I was wondering, I wonder if receptivity and the like kind of capacity for receptivity isn't one of the main factors why many modern relationships don't work out. Like on, on the part of both partners, yeah, like yeah, not, yeah. To, not to say that it's sitting with one person on the, with everybody, because it's like, if you're just in gear all the time, it's like there's going to be friction. It's like the, um, you know, someone came to one of my teachers who was responsible for a whole community of people asking him for relationship advice. And he talked to them and he heard what was happening with them. And then he just said to them, how often in a day do you spend in silence with each other? Mm. And, you know, it just was like, wow, you never think that way. You, you like, you think, oh, okay, like there's a problem and we have to solve a problem. And it's like, but in fact, many problems are just solved in receptivity um, and also like in profound intimacy. I feel like, you know, the, the in-gearness of life can take us out of the ability to just be yeah. present with one another. And then if we're really truly present with one another and silent with one another, we kind of energetically sink, you know, and then there's less, you know, kind of sticky moments um, are just less because we're already kind of in tune with each other on a, on a deeper level. Like what's, can you kind of comment or do you have thoughts about that? Yeah, definitely. Receptivity is that what allows us to see each other. I feel as long mm. as we're in gear, um, it's more that we're more in our extension of our bubble, right? <laughs> so basically, I'm extending my bubble yeah. um, out, which is also really important. Like it is not that one or the other is you know better or worse but mm. that's more factual mm. um and in receptivity i feel i'm much more open to receive and see and with this receiving and seeing honoring and um, develop a certain gratitude and um yeah definitely i feel there is truth to it that with receptivity Mm, actually comes uh, more of a seeing and more of an actual relating. Like, mm -hmm. of course, uh, starting with ourselves, starting with um, receiving ourselves, starting with receiving and realizing life and the perfection of flow of life and um, the presence of the divine and um, and the sacredness of all of it mm. and this is an act for myself 
uh, of receptivity and in that of course also receiving of our loved ones yeah. is um yeah i mean i feel like we we in a sense we like like there's this kind of simple one line from the bible as many as received him gave him gave him the power to re- to be the sons of the divine or the children of the divine and i feel like that um you know receptivity is kind of an upward thing connecting into the divinity but it's also it's kind of a vertical thing but it's also a horizontal thing it's like do i see it in myself can i see it in myself that was something you brought up earlier but then also if i really see it in myself then it's almost like i have to see it in mm-hmm. in my surrounding i don't it's like yeah. it's a it's a reflection it's a mirror and it's just like okay i profoundly see my own divinity then i look at my partner my spouse oh they are also that you know there there's just yeah. uh this very direct recognition and understanding and that doesn't mean that you know there's not friction that comes up or things that don't need to be talked about but i feel like that sets the stage for really profound potential for really experiencing the ideal that we were talking about earlier like looking at looking at uh all of life is an expression of the divinity and your partner is just also an expression of that divinity um because you see it in your own heart and you hopefully are experiencing it also like in your practice on some level right that your mm-hmm. practice is like the kind of training ground where you develop that profound interconnectedness and then when you walk off your mat and you walk through life you're just seeing what's a, what's an extension of that you know that you feel the profound um connection of life yeah two things that come to my mind like as you speak about practice and seeing the or realizing divinity in practice and extending that into the world basically um i'm so grateful for our shared practice of kirtan and bhajans mm. because it is such a powerful mm. way for myself to mm. tap into the joy and into uh, the divine and to be able to tap together into that and mm. to flow into harmony and aspiration mm. together um that is something that on a very practical level um i feel i value a lot a lot Beautiful. that we do have this practice yeah and um what comes to my mind too is gratitude mm. um like how do i practically kind of bring this understanding into every moment basically um, mm. seeing the divine remembering uh recognizing the divine in our partners um for me it is um practicing gratitude like for me it is in the morning when i get up like uh, it is part of my prayer to you know just voice my gratitude to the divine mother mm. for you mm. for our children for our mm. child for serena mm. for life is such uh, and in the evening too like i mm. feel that's for me like setting the tone mm. for getting up and uh, meeting the day and also yeah. in the evening going to bed and yeah. just also gratitude for you know maybe things that we are taking for granted and mm. that that's just the flow and of course you take care of that mm. i take care of that mm. but uh, to not get into this routine of uh, yeah. just taking it for granted that all of yeah. that is happening but um bringing gratitude mm-hmm. into the other being yeah. in our lives and yeah. um for conversations mm-hmm. for pointers for love making for just a togetherness basically yeah. to to meet that and uh yeah. deep sense of gratitude beautiful you know just this morning is funny that you say finding moments of gratitude in the day just this morning i was kind of cutting lemons for lemon water in the kitchen and 
um, Serena woke up and Serena doesn't always wake up in the best um, best <laughs> of moods and she was immediately mama rah! and you came with so much love and so much just generosity of heart you know just I'm here and so loving and so present and I really felt in my heart in that moment so much gratitude for mm -hmm. how you are with both of us um, you know that you really show up with with presence and with love and and care and i feel like that's uh i mean i feel like if you it's just like you said if you notice those moments they just powerfully come into your heart you just feel wow wow thank you wow i'm just so overwhelmed with gratitude but the same moment can happen and you cannot notice it right you can just yeah. uh, it's like that's just what happens every day you go in and you take care of Serena when she wakes up like so you know it's it's a lot about how you see um, yeah. being aware in those moments yeah so as actual practices I feel really prayer mm. gratitude um, mm. also we're taking from time to time our moments to share tea and kind of satsang like yeah um, yeah definitely just sitting together and you know reflecting mm. and looking together and this looking and reflecting together is for me just so powerful and and stepping up mm. in a way and stepping forward and mm. yeah stepping up also into light mm. into heart mm. Mm. So i feel this is also something very important to find moments outside of um, life organization of course there's so <laughs> much to take care of we work together we have our family together there's um, so much to organize like incredibly much to organize for some reasons yeah and um, that can become very very dominant yeah and i'm grateful for cultivating times together that are out of that kind of mm. that are really dedicated for chanting or mm. dedicated for having tea mm. um or for making love so i feel it really really important to make space for each other to not yeah. only meet each other in functional relationship mm. but also in mm. in more divine mm. circumstances beautiful <laughs> beautiful and you know we now talked a bit about partner but somehow also in the stories it was coming up the the little ones also yeah and i was kind of as we were thinking about the topic and seeing divinity in the in the children and the family structure, I was thinking about a very dear friend of mine. She was kind of like my first friend that I was close with when she gave birth. I had friends that had had children before, but not so quite so intimately. And she was quite a bit along in her pregnancy, actually. And quite a bit means really quite a bit. She was and she invited my friend and I over one, like at this late stage in her pregnancy, she says, I'm going to make you guys dinner. And it was a bit like, you're going to make us dinner. <laughs> Shouldn't it be the other way around? Because <laughs> she was really pregnant. Then we got there and she said, I have a dream and I've had a dream for a long time. And my dream is I want to give birth with Krishna Bhajans. And before that, she even said that, We'd already started playing bhajans. We were, and somehow it was just in my heart. It was just only coming Krishna songs <laughs> one after the next. And then we started to play Narayana Hari Om, which a lot of our students know, and um, on the ukulele, which is kind of like, if you can imagine the pure sweetness of Krishna, that song is like the embodiment of mm -hmm. this incredible childlike innocence and joy that that is uh the the baby krishna above and during that song 
um, her labor started. Like she, um, she fulfilled her her fantasy of of uh, you know being immersed in the vibration of of Krishna, um, and then the the little one was born. And a few days after the little one was born, we came in to visit, and that was this kind of stage when they're really just so, 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 so tiny and they're just straight out of the heavenly realm, actually. And I remember just coming to their house. It was the same friend and I. We were in a bit of a hurry. And uh, so we came to the house. We opened the door. And just opening the door, hadn't even seen the child yet, just opening the door, it was like, wow. Like this is the same feeling that you would have in a temple. Mm-hmm. It just felt like the the divine presence was just like thick in the in the space. Um, and in some ways, maybe it's like maybe it's easier to see when the little ones are so little because they come with such a powerful presence of the divinity you know half in this world half in the other yeah. like i feel like when serena was um when serena was first born she was just constantly in chanchari mudra i don't know if that was your experience also chanchari mudra being this uplifting of the eyes just like when she was a baby it was just her eyes were constantly darting up it was like she was half in this world and half in the other and there was there is this sense of the kind of power of the spirit that they that they bring when they're that age yeah i remember also that many people saying to me that babies are so helpless and in a way you know needing so much care and in a way more incomplete or something like that not yet you know like being able to even hold their head up or anything But for me, it was with Serena, like right from the beginning, I felt she is perfect. Like there's Mm. nothing missing. Like I Mm. never felt that she has to develop into something in order to be, you know, like whole or any of that. Like I had a very, very strong sense with her since the beginning, like since she was born that this is perfection here. Like Mm. there's nothing to add. Um, of course, service, um, an opportunity for service and love and for growing so much stronger and deeper and vaster in love than I would have ever imagined that love and service can be. But, um, yeah, I had also very strongly the sense mm. of the little ones are just a wonder of life, like mm. they're a wonder of existence. They're they're divine as they are. And still like I'm um, again and again when being with Serena, she's now four years old and of course having her moments also where she doesn't seem completely <laughs> adorable <laughs> divinity. Um but again and again like I'm just stopping in perplexity and being surprised how complete she is like Mm. how whole she is how yeah how divine she is and do you feel like um in this process of kind of when she was very very young do you feel like lotus birth was what what part did that play do you feel in the Ah, Lotus birth, that might be not familiar to everybody. It's uh, I also didn't know that before coming to Bali, actually. Lotus birth is um, giving birth naturally and uh, not cutting the umbilical cord, but basically keeping the placenta connected to the baby until the connection um, cuts naturally that is anything between three days and ten days the umbilical cord is drying off and at one point just dropping off and the whole idea is that placenta is not just like a 
sustainable piece of meat during pregnancy, but it's actually the sister um, of the baby, of the child. And basically they are growing up together as two. And one is the one in service and the other one is the one who um, will continue life outside of the belly. Um, so the idea of cutting the cord is um, kind of a very harsh separation um, and basically a separation that's not coming natural but an artificial kind of strong artificial uh, cutting of those two and um, lotus birth is like honoring kind of a natural separation and that's what we did mm. um, so basically we kept the placenta you have to tend to the placenta uh, because it is like uh, raw meat basically so you have to tend properly to the placenta and yeah after three days or so it just fell off um, like the the separation naturally happened and um, I feel lotus birth definitely has an influence mm. in that but not only lotus birth, also I feel uh, breastfeeding, prolonged breastfeeding, keeping their kind of um, keeping intimacy basically, yeah. um, or sleeping in one bed um, is also like protecting intimacy. And I feel when intimacy is violently taken away, that creates in children also a sense of separation in a way and this sense of separation um, has to be dealt with mm. of course mm. and uh, kids find their answers and yeah. I feel I want to let Serena grow into their into her in independency rather at her pace mm. than at my pace that comes from rational, structural, logistical circumstances. So I, I really aim to keep her integrity and her, um, her pace. And um, yeah, we are still breastfeeding, and she's four, and um, we don't breastfeed much like uh, twice a day but still like it seems to be for her such an important part of her intimacy and connection like the other day yeah. she just said mama i was thinking all day long about your milka uh, your <laughs> yummy milka milka she calls the milk and the boobs <laughs> <laughs> and kind of she came really at the end of the day like oh mommy you know like i was waiting all day long to have this moment of mm. intimate connection with yeah. you kind of to cuddle yeah. into this intimacy and mm. um i feel it right to provide that basically yeah. does it take time yes could this time be used better and more efficient and whatnot yes but i feel for her it makes a really big difference on how whole she is yeah. in a way like um, and respecting the cycles of nature and the rhythms mm. of mm. nature like I I try to preserve that as much yeah. as I can for Serena. Yeah and when Kirsten was pregnant we read an incredible book um, by our midwife Ibu Robin about lotus birth. Do you remember what the name of that was? I can't remember off the top of my head. But maybe what we can do is just put a link in the bio for people uh, um, in case you're interested in learning more about lotus birth. I feel like that was the best resource that I yeah. found about it. Like yeah. you read the stories of many people who experienced it with their children, hear what their experiences were. And that was just an incredible journey, I think. Like at least I felt it was yeah. going through the book and hearing the stories and then yeah. Um, you know, seeing, I mean, Ibu, Ibu Robin was talking about, okay, in the, in the modern world, people freeze the umbilical cord because it has stem cells yeah. in it that they can use later. And then she was saying, would you rather that those be 
frozen somewhere in a lab or would you rather that they're in the baby <laughs> and it was kind of like That's a strong okay. for life on <laughs> like, there's no question side, there yeah. right like rather that they be in the child yeah. um and it was really as serena was still connected um to her sister um because it's not so easy to handle a baby that's attached to a placenta and kind of to move that around. Um, I think somewhere we have a picture of me with, with the placenta yeah. and Serena. <laughs> yeah, so it made mm. also that we kept her so much more in stillness and sacredness in yeah. a way, kind yeah. of to really um, have this so conscious transition moment kind mm. of to come slowly really slowly into the world and i felt after the um, umbilical cord naturally um you know just released uh, she became also a bit more alive yeah. and connected to yeah. the world and she was more ready yeah. i feel to yeah. to be in the world and we also did the foot touching ceremony right was yeah. that uh three months yeah like in in bali thing. they have this uh yeah, belief right. that the children are so holy that you don't touch them to the ground for the first three months. You just let them be half in the other realm, half in this realm. And then we took her to a beautiful, beautiful water temple. We did a special ceremony and then we touched her foot to the ground for the first time. And I also felt like that experience, you could really see a little bit of a change, right? It was yeah. like she was kind of more ethereal in a way and then kind of touching her foot to the ground and touching into the earth. and. She somehow came more into this plane of existence. Although, of course, you know, the little ones, I think even even after that, she's still very, uh, very present in both worlds. Yeah. But yeah. Um, but I do feel like those moments really like, you know, like you talked about, just gradually honoring the pace. That's just the natural transition of the little one into the world um, really helps them arrive in a way that's right and good. Um, I feel like it's easy, it's very easy to see in the, in the young ones, at least I feel like for yogis, like the, mm -hmm. the divinity is kind of expressing itself just kind of in perfection. But you also mentioned even now when she's four years old and there's kind of more challenging moments, uh, or I remember when she was, you know, when we were living in this one house when she was two years old and she was having a meltdown so big that even the neighbor came <laughs> to tell us that we had to be quiet. <laughs> um, so, you know, in those kind of moments, which are usually at least lightly stressful, if not fully yeah. stressful, um, how to approach how to approach those moments. I feel like I asked the question because I feel like, and I don't know if it's true, but I feel like I've seen a big transformation in how you are with her in those moments. Like maybe in the beginning it was more challenging for you, but by now I see you just totally centered. You know, she's very off center and you're, you're just there and you're supporting her and loving her through it. Like how did that transition come about? I just learned or saw that offering connection in those moments is the most fruitful to do. And at the beginning, like um, at this very strong moments of outburst, uh, the tantrums, like I, it took me a bit by surprise. I didn't even know that <laughs> children would be like that. Like I'm not very educated when it comes to raising children i'm more going with my intuition and meet what's coming on the way not sure if that's the best way of parenting but that's um what's happening for me i'm just available for what's happening and see then how in this development or in the stages we keep connection we keep um we cultivate our love and at the beginning it took me quite by surprise and I I didn't know really how to answer and I just saw that it's um, kind of very strong moments and I tried to you know 
find ways why she is in this distress to to help her out of it or to stop it or to you know try to to manage basically um of course with a purpose to make it stop because it's stressful for everybody um but it didn't work <laughs> <laughs> like it's such <laughs> such turmoils mm. Um, and also, it is not right to suppress them in a way. Like mm. it is something that needs to to just happen and unfold. And more importantly, I found is to to learn to be with it rather than to suppress it and uh, mm. not have that part of life. Mm. Um, of course, you can organize uh, or manage the situations around that. It's happening less often and less strong and whatnot like from food to sleep to whatnot um, is uh, big uh, contributions but um, I understood that it's not about you know getting that out of one's life it's more mm. to learn to be with that and to just accept that um, this is part of her growing like there's a lot going on like emotions are to be discovered mm. Um, hormones that flush through the body that kind of um, just are strong, uh, a yeah. strong experience of an experience. And uh, I feel it's not even right to yeah, suppress or take away this experience basically from, uh, from the growing child and um, seeing that anyway, uh, it doesn't do much to in the moment whatever I try it doesn't really work so I learned that it's really better to just be with her and let kind of the big waves pass mm. and at the same time being always available for connection and mm. solutions and um, and I felt that this uh, worked the best um, to not hop into the distress and getting out of center but um, staying in center just available but without agenda to change stop uh, manage suppress but to be a companion and do you feel like that I'm, I'm just kind of curious back to the role of being a yoga teacher do you feel yeah. like that helped you in your holding space capacity probably yes probably yes but um, I feel from before giving birth as a yoga teacher um, you meet also like strong you know moments yeah. of people's lives and their expression um, it somehow felt easier to stay centered than with a child because i feel as a child it's coming out even so much more mm -hmm. unfiltered yeah. and unprocessed yeah. like uh, like the the breakdowns of a child is just so much stronger I feel than mm. a breakdown that I ever experienced in my in my mm. yoga classes or with uh, students um, so probably it took basically the space holding capacity um, a notch up I'm sure of that and maybe that's also like do you think that also might just be from the intensity of the love in some ways like The more you love someone, the harder it is to watch them go through something hard, right? Like, I'm just curious if that's your experience or not. Maybe. Hmm. Maybe. Probably a, a mix of love, but also the role as a mother to take care, hmm. right? So if a child just freaks out and like it could be quite dangerous, uh, they freak out. Also, there is like the uh, protection and like mm. a responsibility mm. like that's there much yeah. 
stronger even because mm. the child is so much less able to you know to understand what's dangerous what's yeah. hurtful yeah um so definitely i feel that's also mm. part of it mm. Um, mm. beautiful beautiful so now we've covered uh partner and a little bit about child and even even some practicalities how to bring the little ones into the <laughs> world how to be present with them when they're having difficult moments and maybe we get back to the central question which we started with which was how to be with yourself and in those moments like how to maintain your connection to the divinity to the ideal of your heart um, when the when the storms of life are raging strong yeah. um, how to keep this connection alive what are your what are your tips and tricks for actualizing your yourself in those moments i feel i'm very much uh, practicing, <laughs> um, so I cannot speak as somebody who, you know, can give solutions from the perspective I mastered this. So it's I'm in practice. <laughs> I'm in practice, and what helps me is definitely to to be a bit spacious. Um, mm. to be a bit spacious in terms of not always being in gear. Of course, um, life is busy, kid, work, um, bringing all of that together. So there is oftentimes not, you know, I just sit down half an hour and I contemplate and then I come back. That's just not ha really happening so much. Um, but within the activity um, to try to cultivate spaciousness, like to not fill basically the to-do list too full mm. and um, not set the expectations too high, but rather leave space for just natural unfoldment and um, for some contemplation as well, like in between, like of course, uh, when our schedules are full, um, transitions need to happen fast. This is one, something that you said once, like to me, that you just don't have time to stick with the past for long because like you are required to be present for what's here like you cannot have your work problems uh, lingering when you're present with your child like this is uh, not working for either um, so to to be swift in transitions and with that cultivating a freshness and availability um, for what's happening right now. Like being spacious, meaning also to be present for what's happening right now mm -hmm. without um, too many expectations. Of course, with um, a certain set of rules in a way uh, and the way um, we would want to cultivate a refined life it is good to have some principles that yeah. feel in place but um, outside of these principles of kindness love connection um, outside of that not putting on top like a whole structure of to do is uh, how things should be, what to expect. I feel mm. that is for me personally mm. helpful. Beautiful. I don't know, what would you say? I, f I feel like, um, I mean, I remember many, many years ago, there was this book that really touched my heart that it was from this, uh, I guess he was a Christian monk named Brother Lawrence, wrote this book called Practice the Presence of God. And in that book, he 
said whether I'm at, pre he was, his job was to cut vegetables and make the food in the monastery. So he was in the kitchen a lot. And he said, whether I'm in the kitchen cutting vegetables or I'm at the altar in prayer, my state is the same. Mm. And I remember reading that and going, wow, that's like a thousand miles from where I am. <laughs> I preferred it that you know, state of my life is like, I'd rather be in meditation. I would not <laughs> rather be cutting vegetables. And uh, it seemed like, wow, that's really a long way off. Um, but then at, uh, and even I remember at some point in my kind of, when I started to get into the world of Advaita, just kind of like looking very carefully at each moment as each moment was passing and feeling like, okay, the moment is passing and there's a movement of concentration. It's like my concentration is focused on some task. Um, and it, it can appear in that moment like there's a kind of a disconnection from something else that's like in the, in the background of your experience. But what I kind of, and I've had people even ask me that question on a Zoom call. I had a woman, okay, like I, I understand that the divinity is there, but when I'm at work and I'm working on an Excel spreadsheet, is it, is it really still there? Because the concentration is exclusive, right? It, there's a tendency for concentration to exclude, yeah. and then you're only seeing what's here in front of you. But what's interesting over time, I feel like, is that even in those moments of seeming exclusion, where there's con where there's you know intense concentration going on that that is focusing in on one thing, like that relationship is so present that there is no feeling of separation in it. It's like you're aware concentration is focused on one thing, but you're also at any moment in that time aware, yes, but the all-pervading divinity, which is who and what I am, is still here. It, it didn't go anywhere. Um, I feel like there's, an, there's a time period in sadhana where it feels like in moments of concentration, it goes away. Yeah. And then gradually over time, there's this feeling of, oh, like how can it go anywhere? It's not going anywhere. It's here. It's all the time here. And in a certain moment, I can concentrate more on one thing, but that doesn't affect, you know, the, the awareness of who I am. The awareness of who I am is like the background on which life is unfolding. And whether it's stressful situations or concentration or anything else, it does rather seem to be more or less stable. Like the experience of... Um, the experience of what we are or who we are is more or less present all throughout the, the experiencing. I feel like very practically, I can very much relate to what you say, but uh, what I also say, like I'm still in practice, um, that it helps me to limit the time exposure basically yeah. in which I'm strongly triggered in my conditioning. Yeah. Uh, because when I expose myself for too long in that, it just, you know, like uh, really infuses yeah. my being and it uh, moves me from being into into mind, into, yeah. um, into reactivity, into yeah. impulsiveness. Yeah. And I feel um, as in practice, as a learner, um, it helps me to... Um, to limit this exposure a mm -hmm. little as much as I can mm -hmm. and um, withdraw from that uh, into circumstances where Beautiful. spaciousness is nurtured yeah. Yeah. Uh, naturally. Yeah. Beautiful, beautiful, Aww. beautiful. I love it. <laughs> you know, I, I, I must say, um, you know, for the listeners that know Kirsten from our courses and from, from all the beautiful work that she's doing, I feel our students profoundly feel that. Like just the other day, I was having a Zoom call with someone and she said, Kirsten is so present even through the screen. You mm -hmm. know, she's just like, I feel her, I feel her with me. And there was so much joy in my, in my heart of just like, I feel you are a very beautiful, radiant example of, you know, living your truth and, um, being really present in your heart amidst all of the different responsibilities <laughs> that are happening in your life, uh, demanding husbands <laughs> 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 and everything else. Um, 
but really it is, uh, well, what I would say is I and other people experience it as being very potent and very powerful, your, um, your inner research. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it is bearing fruit that is, that's evident. And, you know, I feel like people see it and people appreciate it. Unquestionably, I appreciate it. I, I love you so much and I, I'm so grateful that you're sharing your heart in the, in the world and sharing your experience and your presence and your practice. And, you know, I feel like for anybody out there that's had little ones, probably your practice time does go down. But yeah. one time, the same woman that I was talking about that, uh, that we were singing Krishna Bhajans when her little one was born, she came to me later when the little one was a bit older and said, you know, I'm really struggling because I just don't have enough time for sadhana. And just this answer came through me so strong, I just had no choice but to say it almost. I just said, your little one is Krishna. Like, that's your, that's your sadhana. And I feel like she, she saw what, what was being pointed to and and it is so true also, our teacher said that to me, your child is your sadhana. It's not about running now into the corner and do your sun salutations and meditation. Your sadhana is tending to your child. That's your sadhana as a young mother. Mm. And it is so profoundly true um, mm. because this is where you verify your sadhana, where you can really actualize your sadhana and you are so supportive by this tremendous love that's yeah. there with the child. Of course, it is also tremendously challenging, but at the same time, we are in tremendous support mm. um, of this love. So I feel, yes, tending to a child is sadhana. Mm. Um, if you choose to make it your sadhana and to stay with it and not to turn away from it. I see there's a tendency in many young mothers and um, I could see that uh, definitely also in myself to kind of run back to your previous um, incarnation before <laughs> being a mother <laughs> and you, you know, want to work again and you want to do this mm. and that and that and, you know, your practice is part of your self-identity in a mm. way like mm. I want to, you know, do this postures and this pranayama or this meditation. Uh, this is who I'm, I am like, this is what I need. But that's all outer definitions in a way that's, um, yeah, sadhana is uh, on the mat, great and supportive, but um, it's not a reason to think you're not practicing just because you're not stepping on your yoga mat, but yeah. you can practice with every breath with every moment of connectedness with mm. your child so i feel if we choose to our children can be our sadhana if we can mm. really let go of our past self definitions yeah. and tend to the moment uh, it can be for me uh, it is was one of the most transformative sadhanas that mm that I have a practice, mm. also due to having you at my side. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. I remember uh, a very sweet interaction once with Johanna, who said about her little one, Metta, that was the name of her child, Metta is my guru. <laughs> yeah. I was so touched. Just, uh, you know, this is what life brought for for this moment. This is what, this is the opportunity to love that you yeah. were so beautifully and eloquently sharing. Um, you know, this is my, this is my opportunity to really go deep in my sadhana. And my sadhana may look different than, than what it used to look like, but it's equally potent and equally mm. powerful and equally beneficial and equally uplifting and, you know, I, I love your um, just up to the next level, right? Up, up to uh, up to the vibration of love, and then 
the things that seem unsurmountable are really actually just fine. Yeah. Like, you know, yeah. from from the height of your being, it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Full, full, full gratitude. And full gratitude to all of you for joining us on this big adventure today. We're sending all of our love and all of our gratitude from beautiful, bountiful Bali. Mm. And uh, yeah, thank you, thank you, thank you. This was Wisdom in Motion with the Akasha family. Keep shining in the spirit of yoga. Mm.